welcome to um, this uh, taste today. Um, I understand that you're all um, applying or interested in applying uh, for uh, a degree at SOAS. Um, it's uh, very great, very, very good to welcome you here. Um, Southeast Asia is a, a discipline that's been taught at SOAS for very many years. Burmese has been taught for over 100 years at SOAS and Indonesian for almost as long, I think. I'm not sure exactly how long. My name is uh, Justin Watkins and I'm professor of Burmese and linguistics. So I teach Burmese language and uh, various subjects in, in linguistics. Um, and I'll be talking to you in, in a, a bit later. But first of all, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Su Chen, who is our um, Indonesian teacher. And she's going to get, do a small presentation about Indonesian and we'll do Burmese um, a bit later. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Justin. So my name is Suchan Marching, and I am lecturer in Indonesian. And today, instead of uh, talking about Indonesian, you know, like uh, Indonesian language per se, I'm going to talk about Indonesian cultures as well. Okay. Uh, and if you want to know a bit more about Indonesian language, you can actually see the YouTube videos. Uh, it's called SOAS Language in Lockdown. And then you can type Indonesian and Indonesian grammar and my, you know, like videos about uh, Indonesian language are there, the two videos there. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Indonesian cultures and traditions and please feel free to ask anything. Okay, right. So, so here it is. What people usually know about Indonesia is it's a patriarchal country with the largest Muslim population in the world. Okay, that's what usually people say when they hear about Indonesia. But uh, Indonesia is a lot more complex than that. So officially Indonesia recognizes uh, six religions, Islam, Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. But besides uh, being the largest Muslim population in the world, Indonesia also has the largest Buddhist temple in the world, and it's called Borobudur. So this is the interesting thing, yeah. Um, this is because Indonesia also, in the past, Indonesia has a very long Buddhist and Hindu history. Now, one of the examples, for instance, is Bali. People always think that Bali, uh, Bali is not Indonesia. Some, uh, some of some of the people, not not always, they, some of them think that, but Bali is actually in Indonesia. Okay, so eighty-three percent of the people in Bali are Hindu, and Hinduism has been mixed with animistic and local traditions. So. The Hinduism in Bali is actually very different from the Hinduism in India. Um, for instance, the Balinese make offerings to the ancestors and, um, and, and spirits connected with their local places such as mountains, seas and trees. And uh, because of the requirement that Indonesians must believe in one God, the Balinese have to adopt the divine oneness, yeah, which you cannot find in India. And the caste system in Bali is not as strong as in India and is now disappearing. Now, what is Indonesian culture, if you ask me? Um, my answer is there's no such a thing as Indonesian culture because there are hundreds of traditions and belief systems. There are over 700 languages spoken in Indonesia and the language Indonesian became the national language only in 1928. It is so Indonesian is a version of Malay and the language it's spoken is in, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, Singapore, and in the small part of Southern Thailand. So if you learn Indonesian, usually you will have uh, no problem understanding Malay. Yeah, so you can speak with people in Malaysia. Mm. You may misunderstand them a bit, but it's not gonna take long for you to understand Malaysian people. And, and also Brunei, because uh, two years ago, actually I went to Brunei and I just you know spoke with the people there in Brunei and they, they understood me fine. 
no problem at all. And also in uh, some part of Southern Thailand, yeah, they, they, they speak uh, Malay there. And Indonesian language is almost genderless, but the more modern words have gender. And I'm going to explain why, why Indonesian language is almost genderless. Now, this is, this is the most probable uh, reason, okay? Indonesia has the largest matrilineal society in the world, actually, now, even now, okay? It's called the Minangkabau, and the total population is about 8 million. And I'm going to explain to you what matrilineal society is. So the family name, I think most of you will have your family names from, the fa from your fathers, right? But in matrilineal society, family name and property are inherited from mothers to daughters. Yeah. So the sons in this in this um, custom, the sons don't really get anything. Yeah. They, they will they will get something, but at the discretion of the daughters. Okay. So this is the matrilineal society in Indonesia, which is which I think is quite interesting because Indonesia is known to be a patriarchal country. And most of these people are committed Muslims, but the matrilineal system has started to change because of the stronger Islamic influence now. And also the stronger, you know, like patriarchal systems also, also has more and more influence now. And women rule the roost while men hold positions of political and religious lead leadership in this society. So it is matrilineal, lineal, but not matriarchal. And in the past, actually, in the past, women had quite high status in, uh, the, in, in Indonesia. Yeah? It was not called Indonesia before, but in, in these islands known as Indonesia now. The high status of women in Southeast Asia had been recorded by European travelers, especially during the pre-colonial period. This did not mean that men and women were equal, but they had different roles and women's spheres were very extensive compared to their European counterparts during that period. And women were active traders and had extensive power in household decision making. And until around the early 19th century, premarital sexual relations in the islands now known as Indonesia were not regarded as taboo and virginity and marriage was not expected. And compare that to the um, European counterparts at that time, yeah, because in, um, in 19th, uh, you know, like 18th or 19th century, my goodness, virginity was, was uh, like required at that time in Europe. Now, however, in Southeast Asia, if a woman got pregnant, there was a requirement that the man must marry her, okay? And this is another interesting thing about uh, Indonesia. So perhaps you think that Indonesia is a patriarchal country and sex is considered taboo, but there was this one, 15th century Hindu temple located on the slopes of Mount Lawu on the border of, uh, between uh, Central and East Java the symbols of male and female genitals. It was so highly sexualized place, this one, yeah? So the, the, the symbols of female and male genitals couldn't be found everywhere in this place. And, um, and indeed, some European missionaries uh, have taken notes, the, the missionaries who came in the, around 16th or 17th century, I've taken notes that the people in um, on these islands, they were just so um, highly sexualized and they were just, even some of them said that they were immoral because women, women were naked. Women actually, um, many of them actually didn't wear covering on the tops. Yeah, so that's why there were notes like that from European travelers. And why have these diversities changed? I'm going to have to, tell you more in classes. And of course, I'm going to, uh, because I teach language, of course, I'm going to uh, teach language in such a way that you also understand cultures and why the language is like that. So while teaching language, I'm going to talk about cultures as well. That's all from me. Uh, you're welcome to ask any questions. Okay, thank you.
Great. Well, thank you, Sutin. Um, right. We have uh, we have no no questions yet. I don't think so. I'm going to carry on um, and we do some yep. screen sharing first of all. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, uh, Myanmar and the, uh, the Burmese we teach. So just um, as you'll all be aware, Myanmar, Burma has been in the news a lot. The last couple of weeks, there was a military coup there on the 1st of February. Um, and actually, I mean, it, it's a, a terrible event and things are changing fast and we are concerned and worried about our friends and colleagues in Myanmar. Um, but for the people I'm teaching Burmese at the moment, it's been incredibly motivating suddenly having this, this uh, um, massive event going on and uh, the language learning resources that it's generated have been really um, fascinating. So we're all kind of galvanized and um, reading material from Burma and Myanmar um, at the moment. So um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is uh, um, ask, first of all, if you if any of you are interested in learning uh, Burmese or Indonesian specifically, do say so. Um, we're not quite sure what uh, aspect of Southeast Asia it is that you've um, that attracted you um, to us and to this session. So do please uh, tell us more about yourselves. Um, uh, Myanmar, you'll see, is uh, in mainland Southeast Asia. It's sort of the western edge of uh, the area that we usually define as Southeast Asia. Um, and it's sandwiched between Bangladesh and uh, Thailand with uh, borders with uh, a long border with China and to the northeast as well. So that's where it is. And culturally, it sits between culturally, it sits between Southeast Asia, India and China. So both linguistically, culturally, um, you can't uh, learn any Burmese really without dealing with politics and Buddhism. Those are two um, uh, core uh, features of um, of the country. Hold on, I'm just trying to find uh, the chat uh, channel, which has disappeared. Hold on. Too many, too many windows opened. Um, I think someone sent a message in chat and I can't find it. Hold on a second. Where's the phone? Oh, there we are. It's behind me. There it is. Hold on. There we are. Good. So um, this is the BBC News. What I'm sharing with you now is the BBC News live feed of events in uh, Myanmar related to the coup um, and a very um, powerful image there of Buddhist monks wearing their COVID masks. So, of course, we've got the COVID pandemic, which has forced us all online and is um, a reason why we're all wearing masks at the same time. But the streets are filled with uh, people protesting against the, um, the military coup um, and the BBC has uh, Burmese language coverage of that and another reason for showing you this of course is to show you the um, very very beautiful Burmese uh, script um, which is one of the most enjoyable parts of learning Burmese it's not like learning Chinese characters it's not that difficult we can learn it in a couple of weeks and I'm going to show you um, how we set about learning it and um, the first steps in a moment um, but it's an Indic script which means it's borrowed from the scripts designed for South Asian languages so it's related to the script used for Hindi and for Tamil um, and those scripts uh, traveled with uh, originally with um, Hinduism to Southeast Asia and spread about the region and were adapted to uh, to be used for Southeast Asian languages. So Burmese has its own adaptation um, of that family of writing systems. Thai does, Cambodian does, also Old Javanese and um, lots of other languages around the region. But the Burmese script is particularly beautiful because it's been adapted to this uh, sort of round shape. Uh, it's very, very distinctive and it's fun to learn and um, easy to learn, easy to learn to read and write. We, it only takes a couple of weeks to, to get going. Um, so to bring those things together, here is some uh, coup related uh, military coup related material that we've been reading in classes uh, this week. So this is a, an infographic about how to, you know, how to prepare to go out on the streets protesting. What's remarkable is that the protesting happening now in 2021 seems to be fearless and has a sort of carnival um, aspect to it. Uh, the last time that people were out in the streets in large numbers was in 2007. You may have heard of the Saffron Revolution where there were um, beautiful pictures of, uh, of monks um, marching in long in long lines through the streets but that ended in tragedy people were terrified and the military um, used live bullets and a number of people were killed including some monks and that was shocking that uh, the military should um, turn uh, violence upon monks in its own in its own country 
the lid seems to have come off now. Um, people stopped being afraid to express themselves around 2011, 2012. Um, and since then, social media and mobile phones, smartphones have become ubiquitous in, in Myanmar. And so the flow of information cannot be controlled in the way it could be in, in um, 2007. So information like this, infographics, photographs, memes, um, it's a sort of social media uh, protest event, which is uh, fascinating. So here, the infographic I've shared with you on the screen there tells you what you should wear. So down the left hand side, you should wear a long sleeve shirt, two layers, you need a hat, you should have jeans, you should have shoes that you can run in easily. I mean, it tells you there's on the right, there's five pieces of advice. So um, go to make sure you stay in crowded places, don't go out and protest on your own, um, keep following the news. Um, tell someone in advance where you're going um, don't confront the police full on and uh, make sure you get home before dark. So then and we've been using those instructions as a way of learning the um, grammatical, uh, the, the syntax and the grammar in those instructions, um, which has been really engaging for the students learning. And there's some good, um, some good learning points in there as well. And it's great advice if you go on a protest um, as a student, of course, which lots of students um, do. I certainly did when I was a SOA student many years ago. Right, what I'm going to show you now, if I can switch to another set of images, also on the shared screen. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we go about learning Burmese um, and the first lesson that you come to. These are the sorts of things that you'll um, see. Um, so we divide the learning at the very beginning into learning the script, which needs to be done um, carefully and, uh, and will take up quite a lot of your attention for the first few weeks only of learning the script. Um, and we learn the grammar separately um, using a, um, a transcription system. So hold on, let me reduce that a little bit. So we have handouts like this where you're learning really simple sentences. It's hot, isn't it? It's cold, isn't it? It's good, isn't it? Learning the basics of putting verbs together. But Burmese verbs are, are quite complicated. You learn the, the basic forms and, um, and build them up. And at the beginning, we use a transcription system, so a romanization, so that's a, a way of writing that represents the sounds in a way that you can you can read with a bit of help from from the get go. And then later on, you'll be learning to uh, write what you can say using Burmese script sort of after four or five weeks. Um, that's how long it takes. Um, so uh, that's what you'd see on day one um, in week one. Let me give you a, a few bits of general information about what the language is like. So I've taught you, told you a little bit about Burmese script and you've seen that it has this beautiful rounded appearance. Um, one of the things that these uh, scripts of uh, Southeast Asia, um, these index scripts have in common is uh, the design feature, which each syllable begins with a, an initial consonant. So here you can see that's, uh, that's an M if I can actually I can highlight it like that. That's the, that's the letter M in Burmese. And the vowel that follows the consonant, so if you want to say a syllable like me, ma, me, mo, or maung, you add vowels to the right or to the left or both sides or above or below both sides on three sides. Um, and each vowel has a, has a particular um, direction that it's written in and the syllables are, are read from left to right. So, um, it's an alphabet with some very funky design features, which makes it uh, enjoyable to learn. This is how um, in section two here, you can see how the name of the country, the two names for the country, Burma and Myanmar, which are more or less interchangeable, you can see how they're written. So this here is the letter M, this is the vowel R, so that gives you this syllable here, which says Ma. And then this is the B, the consonant B that you stick at the front. And that says Bama. So but writing Bama. And if we were doing this live in a classroom, which unfortunately we can't do now because of the um, COVID pandemic, I would have you get out um, pens and paper and have a go at writing the circular shapes of the letters to, to show you how, um, how approachable it is. So one of the things we know put, can sometimes puts people off trying a non-European language um, is a different writing system. Um, and Burmese and the other languages that we teach with different writing systems are very learnable and we, we are well experienced in uh, getting people to look, take their first steps. Um, so I'm going to move on for um, lack of time. Um, that's how we write Myanmar. Um, 
The other thing that uh, sometimes puts people off uh, having a go at learning a, um, a non-European language is if it's a tone language, and Burmese is a tone language, so most of the languages in the world are, are described as tone languages, and if you don't already know what that means is that as well as vowels and consonants, the pitch at which a syllable or a word is pronounced um, is one of the d distinctive parts of its meaning. Um, so for Burmese, we've got some pairs here, like the word gu, which is spelled like this, but the word gu means help. So if you wanted to tell someone, please help me, you'd say gu ba, gu ba. And these little L-shaped here, L shapes here are to, te are to indicate that the pitch stays low. So both, both syllables are low in pitch, gu ba. Whereas the same uh, consonant and vowel, but said at a high pitch, means it's a different word and means something else. The tones are, the high tone is represented in the spelling. So you spell the tones in Burmese. It's very, it's much, much, much easier than Chinese. Um, and if you want to, and this word gu said in a high, a high pitch means to copy. So gu ba means please copy it, but gu ba means please help me. So gu ba and gu ba. And that's how it works. And um, that's two of the tones. You've got a low tone and a high tone here for gu and gu. There are in fact four tones in Burmese. So there's two others that you'd learn. But as I say, the tones are spelt out in the writing system. So if you learn how to spell, you remember the tones. Um, it all comes as a, as a package. And the last thing before I um, hand over to you for questions, um, if you have any, is um, one of the other interesting features about the sounds in Burmese I said when I introduced myself that I teach uh, linguistics as well. So some of the linguistic um, nuts and bolts and machinery of the language are the things that I find um, fascinating and I'm um, passionate about explaining them as well. Um, and that's a, a class of sounds that we call voiceless nasals. So in Burmese, as well as a, a syllable ma, you can also have a syllable ma, ma. So you turn your voice off at the beginning of the M and you let the air come out of your nose, ma, ma. So ma is a verb that means to be hard, that's something that's uh, rigid, ma, and ma is a verb that means to order. So ma de means it's, it's hard, it's rigid, and ma de means I order it, ma de. So there's a, a bunch of sounds that have uh, that sort of feature. You can have nya and nya, and you can have na and na. And you can see in the writing system, there's a, there's a hook pointing to the left that uh, indicates this feature in the in the alphabet. So ma and ma. And then finally, slightly frivolously, there's a couple of phrases that have uh, a few of these sounds in them. One of them is th to say uh, to blow your nose, which is na hnyete. So na is the Burmese for snot, and hnyete is what you do when you blow your nose. Na hnyete, um, which uses two of these sounds. And more seriously. Um, capital investment in Burmese, if you're reading the financial news, the word for capital investment has lots of these sounds in it. It's yinni myot nam hu. And again, if we were live, I'd uh, um, invite you to have a go at pronouncing that and, um, and uh, saying the sounds. It's all a lot of fun. Right, so I think that is all I have to say about Burmese language teaching. As I say, especially at the moment, um, Burmese comes with some uh, very energizing and motivating uh, live current events, um, which has been galvanizing our, our language learning experience quite a lot. Um, and we try to keep in touch with what's going on in the country and what's happening culturally. Um, there are plenty of Burmese speakers in London, so there's a bit of a a scene. If you're interested in Buddhism, there are we can do visits to um, London uh, Burmese Buddhist temples. If you're interested in um, films, we can have film screenings. So um, there, there's a large Burmese population in London, and um, I teach with a colleague who is a native speaker of Burmese, Mapazin. Um, and you'd have classes with both of us. I tend to concentrate more on the grammar and the mechanics of the language, and she um, concentrates on reading, and she concentrates more on um, speaking. Uh, we'll divide things up that way. So Burmese will be running next year, as will um, Thai and Indonesian and uh, Vietnamese, the four Southeast Asian languages that we are teaching at the moment. Um, and I'll hand over to you now for um, any questions that you may have about either Indonesian or about Burmese or about the other languages we teach, or indeed um, any aspect of um, 
how you can include study of Southeast Asia um, into your um, languages and cultures degree. Thank you very much. So do we have any... Uh, uh, there is a question from the audience member. Someone asked, uh, I, I think this question is for Su Jing. Uh, why do you think Islam has been so successful in Indonesia? And how did Islam uh, 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 originated in Indonesia? Yeah. Okay, that is actually a long question, but I'm going to try to make it as short as possible. This is really complicated. It's, it's long. Um, why Islam was successful? It was just, um, it was a long story because Islam came gradually, yeah, very gradually. And um, eventually, I don't know how to make it short. <laughs> eventually, uh, <laughs> Uh, they, were, they were more successful partly because they were quite aggressive, yeah, because they, they, they did it by wars. They were, they were quite aggressive, to be honest. And um, yeah, and they gained more and more popularities during the colonialism because when the Dutch came, people considered Islam as a, a, a kind of a symbol to be against the, colon, the colonizer as well. Yeah, so that's how they, they gain more and more popularity. And um, now I'm, I'm talking about the more com contemporary period, why it, it became more popular. Um, hmm, I don't know how to make this short either, uh, but it is, you know, in 1965, there was um, there were there was a coup. There was a genocide uh, of uh, of the of millions of communist people. Yeah, and um, at that time, communism in 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 Indonesia uh, was considered. You know, they stigmatized the communists. They they considered communists as basically as bad, evil, and atheist. They're the same, yeah. Marxism, communism, uh, atheism, they were all the same and they were evil, full stop. And uh, the people who were fighting against the, the communists was at that time, a, a large part was from the, the Muslim fundamentalist groups. And after that, Islam gained more popularity after the 1965. Uh, genocide. I think that's that's uh, that's the my short answer because I can you know uh, this is like a very long, <laughs> you know it's not enough to <laughs> explain. In my a... understanding too, Suchin, is there's sort of polarization, isn't there, between secularism and um, and Islam? There's the is, is the Islamization of of Indonesia has has been a, a polarization of of social values to some degree. In some ways, yeah. I don't know. It's not my area of expertise. Yeah, yeah. In some ways, in yeah. some ways, yes. But I, it's a lot more complex than that. Yeah, it's just. It's a huge it's, country, right? It's an enormous. It's, it's, it's an enormous, enormous issue. Yeah, it's, it, there's just so many things. Yeah. That's part of it. Yes, yeah. but that, that's definitely part of it. Okay. Do we have any other? Yeah, answer your question. <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> if it's not so. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I'm sure, um, Su Chen, you could um, direct the, the person who put the question to some reading um, places where you could find out a lot more about sure. the spread the spread sure. of to. Yeah. Good. Um, do we have any other um, questions or comments from the rest of you, from uh, Anna, Helena, or Ratna? You're very welcome. You can unmute and speak if you wish. <laughs> um, and do you know? Do tell us what your um, what your interests, where your interests lie, what it attracted you to uh, the SOAS degree, and uh, what you're hoping to to gain from it. We would love to know more about you. No, are you there? I, I can't actually see the participants, Justin. How, how can yeah, you, you if you have to go to um ah here we are. So Ravna, you are Indonesian. I understand. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, do, um, oh, I can allow you to, there we are, I can allow them to talk. Oh, okay, I, I, I saw it, I saw them, yeah, Ratna, Anna, and... Um, there we are, Ratna, there we are, sorry, you were yeah. in fact muted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm Indonesian, but I'm interested to study Chinese. Ah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the point that I want to see this session, I just want to know how uh, the Indonesian is taught uh, in university in the UK. And also, like, I'm curious a little bit of uh, Burmese, the language. Good. Right. Well, well, remember that um, in your life and in the world, the opportunities to learn Chinese are very, very many. And the opportunities to learn Burmese are very, very few. Yeah. So if we, can, uh, if we can seduce you into coming to learn Burmese instead of Chinese, um, there will be plenty of opportunities in your life to learn Chinese, should you wish to, but very few to learn Burmese. And it's especially encouraging to see Southeast Asians learning each other's languages. You know, amazingly, there's not a lot of learning of uh, other Southeast Asian languages by people in Southeast Asia. So really, really good to hear an Indonesian who wants to learn, um, learn Burmese. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So if you're interested in finding out more, I mean, either about how we teach Indonesian, which is um, going to be interesting to you, or about Burmese, do um, get in touch directly. I can put our uh, email addresses in the in the chat. So my, I'm Justin Watkins, and my email address is jw2, which I'm just trying to type as I speak. There we are. So okay. do, um, if you're interested, we can we can have a one to one session. We talk any time about uh, about Burmese um, and how it fits into the degree. Um, okay. One of the especially valuable things is that it's still possible to learn one of the Southeast Asian languages, including Burmese. And um, depending, I guess, on the pandemic and the political situation, spend um, a summer or a year in Myanmar learning Burmese. Um, mm. And that's something that not many, not many students um, do. It's only maybe one or two a year, but it's a really incredible um, opportunity, very rare opportunity to study at um, the Yangon University of Foreign Languages. If you want to have a sort of full on authentic Burmese experience, or you can learn um, with private tutors, um, friends and colleagues of ours, or a mixture of both. Um, and that gives you the chance to uh, travel around Myanmar and uh, really absorb yourself um, in the country with um, with relatively few responsibilities. You know, it's something that uh, won't happen again in your life with the opportunity to spend a year somewhere learning language and um, and following your interests. Uh, is it like if I if I want to learn, for example, like any languages in SOAS, uh, it's like is that the compulsory that I have to go like one year abroad to Not spend? At all. I think okay. for Chinese, it is compulsory. As I understand it, you have to check with the Chinese uh, teaching section. Um, and I think you have to do, a, I think you can do a, a different degree in Chinese studies if you want to learn some Chinese and not, not do the year abroad, but the BA Chinese does require a year abroad. Um, for, uh, for Burmese um, and Southeast Asian languages in general, we, we leave it up to you. It's possible to finish the degree in three years and some people choose to do that and then go to the, go to the region afterwards and uh, st either study further or get jobs with NGOs or as journalists or whatever they're going to do. Um, and our graduates go on to do really, really interesting things. Okay. Um, so, or you can spend a year abroad in the, as a third year of a four-year degree, come back, study for another year, and then and then do uh, get on with your career after that. So we leave it up to you because we know that not everyone is up for um, a year abroad. It doesn't suit everyone's funding or life arrangements, whatever they might be. So we leave it flexible. Okay, but is a Burmese, uh, the Burmese like for the BA? Is that like three years or four years? Well, as I say, you can do it in three years or four years. And four now years. you do it under the shell of the degree structure called uh, BA Languages and Cultures. You, ch oh. you choose Burmese as your degree. You can complete the degree in three years without a year abroad, or you can spend the third year abroad and complete it in four years. There's two, there's two formats that you can choose. And you don't have to decide at the beginning. You can decide okay. halfway through. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, what about um, Helena and, uh, and Anna? We haven't heard from you. 
but uh, you're very welcome anyway. Um, you can ask any question if you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just ask, um, you know, I just got an email, um, Ratna's email address because I'm doing the survey about COVID-19. So mm, great. Yeah. I mean, That's yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, let's uh, have more questions now. <laughs> so Rana, are you in, uh, at the moment, are you in Indonesia or are you in? No, I'm in London, actually. You're in London, okay. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are you, have you been living in London for, for some time or? Uh, over nine years. Uh, okay, so you've been. Over nine uh, years, yes. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah, that's good, yeah. 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 You live with well, your parents or here? No, or? alone. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Where are you from originally? Which part of Indonesia? Uh, uh, actually, my family from West Java, close to Bandung, but like I grew up in Jakarta, all my education in Jakarta. Oh, okay. So what did you do in London, like for this nine well, years? Well, at the moment is I'm working and I'm doing some like a Mandarin course. Right. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. And you've decided it's time to do a degree. <laughs> uh, yes. Actually, in 2015, I studied in St. Mary University. Uh, well, it was like a mistake. Actually, after one year, I just <laughs> gave up. <laughs> I studied law. <laughs> okay. Ah, yeah. It and was like very hard. You, what, what attracted you to, to the SOAS degree? What did you What did you see that you liked the look of? Uh, I think it's like the location as well because I'm living in London and also like there are not many uni in London that has like Chinese degree. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And also I heard this a good uni. I mean, I've been there like before. Yeah. There's a lot of like international students as well. Mm -hmm. And I heard that SOAS University is a is a good university to study foreign languages. Mm. Um, so Anna has asked a question, which I'm very happy to um, answer live. I think we've we've not got um, a great deal of time left, but let me answer your question, Anna. So you've asked um, whether you have to pick a specific avenue for languages and cultures, or can you keep the degree quite broad? Um, I think you can keep it broad, um, and you can you can choose to specialize in a particular language and follow that uh, through the whole degree. And there is also some scope for um, uh, for um, including more than one language within the degree, if you wish. So actually, what I can do is direct you to the, um, I'm going to find the Languages and Cultures uh, webpage, um, which is here. So I can show you how that, how that works and how, um, how much flexibility there is. And I'm going to share my screen again hold on a second i just move some things around on my screen there we go so this is the um languages and cultures degree page uh on the soas website and if you go to structure that's where you can see how the how the degree is organized um and in general we have um quite a lot of the first year is uh is fixed um and thanks jeffrey for posting the link there so you'll be doing, um, you'll do certain courses in um, you know, languages around the world, some training in how to go about language learning, um, how to write essays, how to do some career planning, that's language learning and writing, some basic cultures about, uh, basic co concepts of the, um, the cultures of uh, the regions that we teach. Um, and you will um, normally uh, choose a language as well, right? So you'll, you'll, you'll pick a language. Um, in year two, you start um, uh, specialising a bit more on uh, literature or you can also take uh, topics in linguistics. There's quite a lot of, um, of choice. Um, you'll see here the list of modules that we teach, which are specific to different uh, regions of Africa, Asia and the Middle East, which are the three regions that SOAS um, uh, focuses on. Um, and here you have the list of uh, languages that we're running. And um, you will normally have some indication of whether or not um, a language is available in a given year. I, we are pretty, pretty certain that next year, um, Burmese, uh, Indonesian, Thai and Vietnamese um, for Southeast Asia will all be available. Um, 
we sometimes have Cambodians who that won't be running um, next year. I teach that as well, but not at the moment. Um, and then the other languages, so African languages, um, Amharic, uh, Somali, Zulu, and Swahili. Uh, and then Middle Eastern languages, so Persian, Arabic, um, uh, Turkish, and Hebrew. And then languages of um, South Asia, so Hindi, um, Punjabi, Sanskrit, and Urdu is what's on offer at the moment. Oh, and Yoruba is the other African language that we teach. So there's quite a quite a choice, and I think there is some scope um, if you want, and if it makes academic sense um, for you to have a go at uh, focusing on one language and maybe doing some of another language um, if that's of interest. That's certainly certainly possible. So, for example, you might do one year of a second language in your final year if you wanted. Um, but uh, you'll have an academic ad advisor to, to guide you through your um, choices on the degree and how to pick your modules. As I say, there's not much choice apart from which language you're going to do at the beginning, and then you have a bit more choice as you go through the degree. That's how we've planned it. So thank you for the, um, for the question. Um, do we have any more? Uh, I have a question. Is it uh, Burmese is similar with Thai? No, <laughs> not related. Okay. The Burmese is, um, it is in that it's related, um, technically it's related to Chinese, it's Sino-Tibetan, but it's like, it's like Tibetan and languages of Northeast India, Southwest China, um, and it's not related to Thai at all. Um, and if you've done any other languages around um, East Asia, it so happens that Burmese grammar is very similar to Japanese grammar, and it's not related at all to Japanese, but it just happens to be organized in a slightly similar way. Um, oh, okay, normally, because I was thinking that uh, a country normally have similar language with the neighbor country. <laughs> that's not true in Southeast <laughs> Asia. There's a lot of languages going on. Um, and there, so there are five major language families in Southeast Asia, whilst most of the, almost all of the languages in Indonesia are all cl related closely or, or less closely, but they're all one Austronesian language family. Um, in Southeast Asia, there's a, there are three big language families and bits of, bits of two more. So there's Tibeto-Burman languages, which are languages like Burmese, Thai Kadai languages, which are languages like Thai, um, and then uh, Mon Khmer languages, so languages like Cambodian and Vietnamese, although Vietnamese has taken on lots of features that make it appear similar to Chinese in some ways. Actually, Vietnamese and Cambodian are related, and there are lots of, um, you know, there are about a thousand languages in mainland Southeast Asia. That are, most of them are from those three families, and there are two other smaller ones. So some Austronesian languages around, and then some uh, small family called Miao Yao, so languages like Hmong spoken in um, sort of uh, Western Lao, Southwest China, a few in Northeastern Burma and Northern Thailand, so there's another small family there. So it's very, very diverse, lots of languages going okay. on. Um, and they you. do share certain features, even if they're not um, sort of historically related. You know, if you put, what happens if you put languages next door to each other for many centuries? they do take on certain similarities, even if they're not related. So that's happened, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good question. <laughs> I could go on <laughs> answering that for hours. That's exactly what I work on. <laughs> Good. Right, I think we may be um, at this point uh, running uh, yeah, I, I think we'll need to. Yeah, yeah we'll need to wrap up. Okay. I don't know. I, I know Justin, you shared your email address um, with 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 students. Um, Suchin, if you if you would like to share your email address in case you have any questions, that would be great. Sure. Hang on a second. I'm just going to write it down on mm. uh, on the chat there. And, and, and SM100. SM100 <laughs> at SOS dot ac dot uk yeah this so you can ask me any question uh about indonesia <laughs> not any <laughs> sorry i can't answer any question otherwise i get confused if you ask me about burmese you ask you know about burmese you ask justin okay, okay. But also <laughs> but burmese, you, ask justin. <laughs> do, do remember that all our all our information is on the soas website and if you google uh, SOAS Burmese uh, or SOAS Indonesian, our names and faces will pop up pretty re readily. We're easy to find. So do get in touch if you have any further questions. And similarly, if you contact Maggie or the 
um, the team um, who've organised this event, they can um, the team um, who've organised this event, they can forward your inquiries to us very easily. So thank thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, can, I, can I can I can I um make a one announcement? Uh, if you are Indonesian, uh, there will be a talk actually. It's organised by the UK, the 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 society in UK, but it's in Indonesian language. So. Uh, it will be about Chinese Indonesian and um, Muslim and Chinese Indonesians here. Yeah? So it's um, just in case you want to attend. Uh, you can you can see the information on my Facebook actually on my Facebook page. Okay, thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maggie, for organizing it so smoothly, and uh, thanks to all our attendees for your attention and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone.